Hello. Um, we're going to conduct a little experiment. I'd like everybody to look at the screen. This is very important. This is a psychological experiment we're going to do. It's been confirmed by modern science that uh, most of you, any of you in the audience who might have been a Democrat uh, before seeing this, will turn into a Republican. <laughs> which is going to be good for Romney's chances in November. So everywhere you go, show people a little bit of this flag. It doesn't take very long, and the flag does not have to be very big. Even a lapel pin flag will do. And I got this from the news. This is from a Fox News segment reporting on a scientific study. That's all. Just that little brief exposure will turn Democrats into Republicans. So where did they get this idea? They got this idea from a paper, which I'm going to show you in a second, uh, which uses a very complex statistical model. And like a lot of complex statistical models, is um, impenetrable, uh, <laughs> a liable to, uh, well, let me just show you the study and then we'll see. So this, this is based on, this is a faithful reproduction of this study. This came from the paper itself. This is from the abstract. So just a very brief exposure to a flag. I, guess, I think it was a 72 by 46 pixel. Just a little tiny little picture of an American flag will have shifted people's beliefs towards the right away from the left. And the effect, they say, lasts months. Months and months. It can last up to eight months, just that brief exposure. This is a peer-reviewed paper in psychological science. Peer review, of course, the ultimate arbiter of truth. So, all right, let's see how they did it. What they did was, th this made them, this was, you know, we, we saw it made Fox News, but it was reported widely everywhere. And there was some concern uh, about it because people were thinking, oh my, we need to get the flags out of classrooms and so forth because we don't want to inculcate our kids, indoctrinate them into republicanism by showing them flags. So what they did was they found 400 people, 396 people online, these researchers, and they put them through four different sessions of uh, questions and answers over a period of time. Every time they asked people to come back, people would drop out. You know, that happens any time you're going to do any kind of study. Not everybody sticks with the thing. So at, by the second uh, session, I think they only had uh, half the number of people. By the time they made it to session four, only 70 remained. They didn't like the answers of eight of them, so they threw those out. <laughs> and they kept only 63. The 63 people that they kept of course, were the ones who were most enthusiastic about this study. They were being asked questions about, well, you know, do you, do you like President Obama's performance or don't you? Are you a Republican or Democrat? All these kind of things like this. And they picked only from the states where there was uh, wide disparity. So not where the, the, the election was real close, rather where, where the election was very close, where there was a lot of... Uh, tension between these sort of things. So we have a very you know, self-selected audience who are very intensely interested in this kind of thing. Only 60 of them remained at the end. And that wasn't even enough. So what they had to do was they had to create a composite measure of all of this survey that they did. And uh, they call it the voting intention and the uh, uh, likability of Obama sort of thing. They put all this into this very complicated regression model and if you know anything about regression models, it sort of draws a line. And they took that line, and then they subtracted the actual data points from that line, and they call these the residuals. They took those residuals then, about the people, some of those people saw the flag, and some of the people didn't see the flag, and the people who did see the flag had slightly higher uh, negative ratings of President Obama than those who didn't see the flag. And so that was their conclusion that the flag seers residuals tended to disapprove of Obama more. And that was morphed into what we saw just a second ago right there, that this conclusion was drawn from this kind of a thing. This very weak 
ridiculous, rotten evidence. <laughs> However, it conformed to what people expected, what people wanted to see, what people thought that they were going to see, and it passed through all the levels of peer review, and, and, and the journal Psychological Science is a, is a reputable, well-known journal. But I think it's part of the, there, there are several fallacies, and I think this is the publisher Parrish fallacy. Uh, whenever you need a paper, the best thing you could do is you get your students together and you run some little bit of questionnaire on them, but you call it an instrument, which doesn't sound the same as questionnaire. And you get them to answer these questions, and whatever the answers are, you can interpret them however you want. Because that, you, you could have questions like we saw right there, you know, how do you, do you approve or don't approve of Mr. Obama's performance? and you interpret them and put them into some grand theory, and you just go on and on and on about these kind of things, and it's very easy to get these kind of papers published. And there's, they come out all the time, and they're just as nonsensical as this. So basically what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you several other uh, sort of common fallacies that uh, exist in statistical or in epidemiological studies. I'll try to stick mostly with medical ones. Uh, although I'll do a little bit of global warming at the end. My, my interest has been, I started out actually doing meteorology and climatology, and I was a past associate editor of Monthly Weather Review, and I was on the American Meteorological Society's Probability and Statistics Committee, all this kind of stuff. And uh, my interest was always in forecast and forecast goodness. So what makes a good forecast? How do you tell? Is it useful? that kind of thing, and that led me into statistics, uh, which is now how I make my living, because after deciding that global warming models were not that skillful or useful, I found less employment in the meteorological line <laughs> than I would have liked. But that's okay, there's plenty of other uh, fish in the sea, as Willie might say, that we could, we could <laughs> capture with this. And it turns out, I thought Dr. Orient, she mentioned witch burning. I'm going to have an example of uh, witch burning later, that's one of the causes of global warming. There's going to be an increase in witch burning. We'll see. Okay. So, I mean, I don't know if there's any Democrats left after the exposure to the flag. But uh, has anybody in here been to a, has anybody not been to a 4th of July party, or parade? Everybody's been to a 4th of July parade. This is another thing, unfortunately, that will turn people into Republicans. This is from the U.S. News and World Report. Uh, this is from Harvard, uh, a study, so it can't be wrong. If you show up to a uh, Fourth of July parade, you're liable to turn into a Republican. This is what uh, they, they said. So this is the report, this is the news report, and this is the paper itself, uh, so that they start with the theory that uh, they say that Republicans feel themselves more patriotic than Democrats, and that uh, the, the political, well, you can see it right there, those, those who are more liable to be patriotic are more liable to go to a 4th of July parade, and the 4th of July celebrations and where Republicans dominate are more politically biased events, and therefore they will dangerously socialize children into Republicans. <clears throat> this, is, this is actual research, and so I want to know how it was done. It was widely, this too was widely reported in the press, and it came sort of on the heels of that first thing where the brief exposure to a flag will turn you into a Republican. So people were getting very nervous by this point because of course at Fourth of July parades, what are you liable to see? people carrying American flags. So you get sort of a double dose, and that's not good. So what they did was, they did not actually go out and measure anybody whether or not they attended a 4th of July parade. That's too hard. They, they surveyed a group of people. They asked the people, where did you live when you were a child? They looked at where the person lived as a child. They went back into the meteorological records and they saw whether or not any precipitation happened on the 4th of July in the town in which they lived. If it rained at all, they decided that there was no 4th of July parade. And so they counted that as no exposure to a 4th of July parade. <laughs> if it was sunny, 
they said a 4th of July parade happened. And therefore, they must have also gone to that 4th of July parade. <laughs> Do you see everything that's happened here? It, 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 not even, who knows if there was even a 4th of July parade in the town in which they live. That's not even measured. And whether or not it rained is not necessarily going to stop that parade from occurring, but they made all of these assumptions so far. And they did that over a period of their, uh, the youth from, you know, uh, essentially, I can't remember the, the, the first year they did it, but something like five or six years old, up until they were 18. And then they had, of course, a complicated statistical model where they were, had these knobs and dials they could twist, and they did all these kind of things. And they decided that, uh, at this model said that every time you go to a parade, every time you go to a parade, this is their conclusion, every time you go to a parade increases the chance that you're going to be a Republican by about 2%. So if you go every year until you're 18, you increase that chance by about 36%. <clears throat> and this was reported seriously in the press, it was reported seriously in the journals and people, because, you know, when you, and, and the fallacy here is, it's the overconfident academic expert fallacy. And this is the most common one, I think. Uh, maybe not the most pernicious one, but the most common one. Where you look into the set of data and you say, I can't think of any other reason that explains this correlation that I see. Therefore, there is no other explanation. And whatever my preconceived bias is must be the right thing. Now, it used to be, you know, statistics is, terrible at this. It's, it's a terrible profession. I, I, you know, I always tell people I have a magic trick. Uh, you know, whatever you want to do, if you want to, you want to make people disappear like magicians do, so if anybody comes up to you and want to make a crowd disappear, tell them, I'm a statistician. And then all of a sudden people have, and, and everybody I've ever talked to said, oh, I had a statistics class before. I, I hated it. And there's good reason why you hated it, because <clears throat> Statisticians are unfortunately under the impression that our field is a mathematical subject, and it is in some sense, but that's not the purpose of statistics. The purpose of statistics should be to quantify uncertainty and to understand uncertainty that we have. Now, some fields, like physics, for instance, not necessarily physics applied to uh, uh, like climatology and so forth, but some areas like nuclear physics and all these kinds of areas, when someone posits a theory, they have a hypothesis for what accounts for some observed data. They will test that hypothesis out, try to get confirmatory evidence, which is the right thing to do, but they'll also try to find other explanations for that data, try to find things that would also explain it or which would disprove their theory. This happens a lot in the so-called hard sciences in chemistry and physics in particular. But in statistics, all that counts is that you find any kind of correlation that fits whatever conceived notion that you have of your data. And it's true that, uh, you know, causation is not correlation, but if you have causation, you must have correlation. So this, the, the fallacy gets it backwards. We've all heard that, you know, correlation isn't causation, but if you have causation, you must have some sort of correlation. But the reasoning is this, it's, the, it's a standard, the Latin fallacy, I'm not usually giving the Latin names, is this post hoc ergo propter hoc fallacy. X happened, then Y happened, therefore X caused Y. And as long as you can have this thing called a p-value, which I'll talk about in a few minutes, then your theory is true. That's, you know, it, it is a formal fallacy, and it's a terrible thing that statistics is based on this kind of reasoning and it accounts for more over-certainty than anything else. So I think this is the, the most used fallacy. Let's see some others. Um, well, we're talking about the EPA, and uh, the EPA wants to regulate this, not farmland. I, they want to regulate that as too. But they want to regulate dust, uh, dust that comes off of farmlands, and I think most of us know that. Uh, so. This is a CARB, the California Air Resources Board. You know what, if it happens in California, it's gonna eventually happen in the rest of the country. So it's good to study California as where the source of infection begins. <laughs> CARB put out this press release that said that uh, airborne particulates, this P2.5, PM2.5, 
fine particulate matter, elevates the risk from heart disease and other types of disease. So if you breathe this stuff in, e, e, uh, the CARB says, and now EPA wants to say, you're going to increase the risk of death, and that sounds pretty bad. And so California wants to begin regulating uh, diesel engines and farms and all this kind of thing. Okay, so they said uh, this heart disease, of course, the, the, the non sequitur at the, the bottom part of their press release is they say heart disease is the number one killer in California and is responsible for about a third of the deaths, and that's true, but it doesn't follow from what happened above it. All right, so even if, even if uh, this is deadly, even if the particle inhaling these particles is deadly, it doesn't necessarily mean it has anything to do with heart disease or even saying it's the number one killer. This, is, this little medical fallacy, you, uh, as many of you as physicians will understand, there, there's got to be a number one killer, right? Everybody's going to die, and they're going to die of something. And so at any point in time, something will be the number one cause of death. So we cannot ever eliminate the number one cause of death. It is an impossibility. It's exactly so. Exactly so. So this is the kind of press release they put out. Um, there was a study, this is the Jarrett study, that I actually looked at. I was professionally involved in this one. Uh, this is from the... Uh, the executive summary of that study. It's a very large study where they looked at uh, lots of Californians over a wide period of time. And uh, what they say is uh, all-cause mortality is significantly, in a statistical sense, associated with this PM 2.5 exposure. They admit that uh, the statistical modeling might have something to do with their results. But if they controlled for residents where people lived, uh, and they employ this thing called a land use regression model. They found elevated effects on all cause mor mortality. So, this is the, the study that the CARB relied on in order to affect their regulations. Okay? So, let's look at how that was done. So, what they did was they gathered a bunch of people together who at one time lived in California for at least part of their lives. They may not now have lived in California. They found them elsewhere. And they looked at where they lived, OK? Then from where they lived at one point in their life, not where they worked, not what they did for a living, not anything that they might have done elsewise in their life, but where they lived, they measured the distance to the nearest highway, OK? They looked at from where they lived, they <laughs> measured the distance to the nearest highway. Okay? So that's one mile, two miles, maybe you live only a few blocks, okay, something like this. At one time in your life, maybe, you looked at this. Okay, so then what they did was they went out and measured uh, this PM 2.5 along various points on highways in urban and suburban areas. And then, because they don't actually have measurements everywhere, they employed this land use regression statistical model, very complicated smoothing model, which estimated points of uh, PM 2.5 where they did not take measurements. And then they assumed that those points that they estimated were without error, which were 100% correct. Okay? So the distance you were then from the highway was able then to measure how much PM 2.5 you definitely inhaled. Even though they never measured exactly how much PM 2.5 anybody inhaled. Then they looked at the death certificates uh, of these people and found out, you know, at least that measured fairly well. Although, as you know, as physicians, that what people put down on the death certificates has some error. You have to put a cause down, even though it may just be old age. You might put heart disease or something. So that has a slight error in it, too, not accorded any significance to these authors. After all of this, they went through one statistical model saying, uh, what if we account for the fact that you live in Los Angeles or you live up in Stockton, say, 
or you live up in Reading or some place that's far from any uh, civilization, that kind of thing. That model didn't work. They tried another one where they, they, they manipulated things a little bit more. They took into account different weightings for the uh, types of diseases, and that one didn't work. They went through nine of these models, eight of which showed no effect. One showed a bare, very slim effect, very tiny, 1.04 risk ratio for all cause mortality. And the, the strange thing about it was, it was mostly driven by, the all-cause mortality was driven mostly by heart disease, of course, because heart disease is the number one listed cause of death. They said then that the people who lived nearest the sources of the PM 2.5 had a higher risk of dying, and usually of dying of heart disease. But the strange thing was, the people who lived in the urban areas had a much empirically measured less chance of dying by heart disease. The people who lived in the suburban areas who are furthest away from this dust had a much higher chance of dying. So only statistics can correct that kind of uh, flaw <laughs> in the observations, and the model turned it exactly right. The reason is simple. If you live out in the country and you're 10 minutes away from, uh, 15 minutes away from an ambulance, the, you know, it takes 15 minutes for the ambulance to get there and 15 minutes for the ambulance to get to the hospital, that's a long time. If you live in downtown Los Angeles and you have a heart attack, you're gonna get taken care of much faster. So it turns out though that the, the actual evidence showed that living near the sources of PM 2.5 was a benefit, but so they had to remove that because it didn't accord with their, with their preconceptions. Now, <clears throat> this is the, also called the ecological fallacy. There's the friend of a friend of a friend fallacy. I can't measure what I think is the real cause. I can't actually measure anybody's PM 2.5 inhalation. I can't, it's impossible. But I can't even actually measure the direct effects of that cause. But I can measure things that maybe kind of are sort of related, and I can pretend that those are the real things and report on those. This is the number one fallacy used by the EPA all the time. It's used all the time in epidemiology. They can't measure what they want to measure, so they measure proxies. But that's sort of, and the uncertainty and all that kind of stuff is washed out. When you read the conclusions, no words of all that stuff I was telling you was in there. Now, I actually submitted all these comments in a you know, professional way and everything, and they were taken into account at the CARB meeting where this was decided. And they had a discussion, and they discussed, oh, well, what about Briggs's results? And they said, well, this is true. His criticisms are true. But other people make the same mistakes, and those mistakes aren't held against them. So we should not hold those mistakes against the Jared paper. And that's it. Because, every, because this fallacy is so common, it must be okay because it shows, you know, academics are getting grants for it. <laughs> Therefore, it must be real. Even though we, of course, acknowledge all these things are true. Okay. Yeah, that's statistics for you. Right on. I got this study from Willie here a couple of uh, weeks ago or a month ago or something. Everybody knows about how deadly radon is. Um, they were coming to one of these, I think, where was this, Minnesota? Yeah, Minnesota. They were coming to Minnesota and talking about radon and uh, dying of lung cancer, very bad, all this kind of stuff. So it's in the news all the time. This isn't that long ago. And so how do they find this thing out? Uh, well, this is probably one of the best studies. I read this study that Willie gave me, and I thought that the statistics in this paper were very good. The, the methodology was very good. They, did, they, they, found a po they, they, they say they found a positive association between radon and lung cancer consistent with previous studies. Okay. So what they did was they took, uh, they, they had 57,000 Danes, which is a lot, and they actually measured the real exposure. 
they went to the houses where these people actually lived, took into account the geology and so forth, and measured the amount of radon. So they actually took the actual exposure data that people actually had for the actual length of times that they were living in these residences. And they actually measured uh, lung cancer. It was a very nicely done study. Except, look at this right here. The adjusted risk ratio for lung cancer was 1.04, and look at the confidence interval. It's 0.7 to 1.5. Now, without explaining too much about statistics, if that confidence interval is on either side of one, means no effect. Okay, no effect. And then for those non-smokers with a slightly higher uh, radon concentration, again, they said they found an effect, the confidence interval even wider among non-smokers. So uh, essentially, they found no effect. They said there's nothing to see here. Except that they reported, you remember, we find a positive association between radon and lung cancer. Well, why is that? We just, everybody knows these kind of statistics when you're pointing, they just said no effect, but now they say we found an effect, what's going on? Well, they said, well, it's true we found no effect, but, you know, in all these precise measurements we took, we did not measure their fruit intake or traffic-related air pollution, or other contaminants that these people had. Therefore, we didn't measure everything that could have caused lung cancer. And that's true, they didn't. But they did measure the radon. And they found no effect. So, this is the everybody else said it was true fallacy. <laughs> so, even though your results are the exact opposite of your belief, uh, explain them away and then state your belief. This is the safest thing to do. Uh, there doesn't seem to be too many young academics in the crowd, but if you are, uh, don't make the mistakes that Willie and I made. Uh, wait till you have tenure <laughs> before announcing anything that goes against what people commonly believe, or you'll be in deep kimchi. These, uh, these are from the Daily Mail, uh, a nice tabloid. I like it. They have garish headlines and so forth. Chocolate's bad for you. Statistics say so. Uh, this is a report from January of this year, the, the one on the left. Until, what, what's the next date there? It's only a couple of months later. April. April. Ah, yes. Three months later. Chocolate is, yes, same picture. Chocolate's bad for you. Well, before it was good for you. Then it was bad for you. Now it's good for you again, and I haven't looked at what they did in July, so it's probably bad for you again. All of this is confirmed by statistical modeling. Of course, vitamin pills will increase your risk of disease, taking vitamin supplements. That's what the report was on the 21st of May of this year. And then was it four days later? Five days later. No, that's not true, actually. They work. Statistics show it. It must be true. Unfortunately, women who drink four cups of coffee a day have a higher risk of incontinence, especially if stuck in traffic. That's from April of last year, and we had to wait an entire year for new statistics to come and show. I couldn't find this one in the Daily Mail. I, I apologize for that. I had to go to Reuters. Caffeine is not tied to worsening urinary incontinence. In both cases, the similar kinds of statistical models were used. Just a couple of more. Maybe this is the last one. This one, uh, if you remember, when pomegranate uh, first hit the scene, maybe about five, ten years ago, everything was pomegranate this, you know, you could do, do you, those palm juice, and it was six dollars or something for these jars. And, it was going it, it was the nature's Viagra, it was going to cure baldness, it restored vigor. Everything that could possibly good happen, happened because of pomegranate juice. So they were, <clears throat> initially did the studies, when they, when they looked for, everybody did a study on pomegranates, uh, because it was the in thing, the hip thing to do, and they did find that uh, it was great for menopausal symbol, uh, symptoms, such as hot flashes and, and whatnot. And then we had to wait a few years later to do more studies, and then discovered that pomegranates were no better than a placebo. And this often happens. 
this is another kind of statistics that often happens. People using exactly the same reported methodology, the exact same kind of statistical model. People are not making mistakes in the, you know, th these are not computer mistakes or data entry mistakes or fraud or anything like that. But what people never, bias, confirmation bias, is when you find an effect which you want to see. And it's something that always happens to the other guy. It can't possibly happen to you. Right? It's a, I, I tell this, it's a, not a very big anecdote or anything, but for one year I worked for the National Weather Service and we had to go out every hour and take observations. And we had a digital thermometer that, had, uh, that read out to the nearest tenth of a degree and we would put into the nearest degree into the computer system what the temperature was. And so I was playing around with this data, and of course these digital thermometers are very accurate and nothing to be suspicious of, but you go and look at the data itself over a year and you expect to see a nice curve of temperatures. What you saw were bumps every five degrees. People, they expected to see something that was closer to their five finger digit bias. And this is confirmed in lots and lots of studies. You, you see the thing, it's right there in front of you, you're sure you're not making any mistakes, but you somehow just average it out a little bit and you put things toward what you want to see. And the same kind of thing was happening with pomegranates. Whenever you see these initial studies, when you see new drugs introduced and so forth, they're always great. Everything's working wonderfully and beautifully, but as time goes on and more studies accumulate, the effect size decreases, decreases, decreases. And this happens all the time, and the fault is in statistics. And the way we do statistics, I'll explain, because of this. And I don't want to go on and on about this, but statistics is not what you think it is. Now most of us have, if we want to say that PM 2.5 causes heart disease, that's a theory, right? We want to say that increasing carbon dioxide is going to warm the planet by so many degrees. That's a theory. We say that pomegranate juice is going to reduce hot fl uh, flashes in uh, postmenopausal women. That's a theory. We have these theories. They're all empirical. They're very testable. None of them are ambiguous. We have some data that we collect, right? Some observations and other information that we have. What we really want to do is we want to use some kind of method that gives us the probability that theory is true given all of the information and data that we have and some way of modeling it. That's what we want. That's what nobody gives you. It, almost nobody. There are statistical ways of doing that, but almost nobody gives you these ways. Instead, they give you something like this, this complicated thing right down there. And I'm going to explain it. And I'm going to explain two concepts to you that nobody ever remembers. And so let me just do a quiz here. Even though I have the equation up here, no one will be able to guess it. Does anybody think they know what a p-value is? We've seen them all the time. Sir, have a go. Uh, no, no, I want to see if anybody... No, you, you all read them, right? You all see them in the studies. You see the p less than 5, p, 0.05. You see it's less than the magic number. That means significance. Have a go. No, I think the gentleman behind you is going to have a go. Uh, I'm not an expert, but my understanding is a normal curve, and then you have uh, lines that engage that show deviations from the curve. Yeah. And then you get out of a certain distance. Uh, this. Uh, I'm not an expert. <laughs> um, what I remember many years ago, and that was many years ago, I studied. Uh, probability and statistics, and uh, we used to measure something, and we had a mean, and we had a, a normal distribution, or some distribution that we used uh, to describe it, Gaussian. And uh, as you got farther out from the mean, uh, there was uh, a probability uh, was getting lower, and, and uh, at some point where it was uh, either, yeah, 5% yeah. of the total, uh, and that was the distance that the deviation that gave you that P uh, Okay, 5%. I blame myself for that because we have taught you very badly. Okay. Let, let's, have some, let's see if anybody else. Let, you guys, I want you to, you guys all read this stuff. We just read this theory, okay? Jared's got a paper out there. He says, 
PM 2.5 causes heart disease, and it has a p-value, and it's less than 0 0.001. Okay, what does that mean? What does that 0 0.001 mean? Random chance, what does that mean? What does that mean, random chance, though? I don't even understand that. <laughs> random chance of that result is only 1%. Do you think the random chance, okay, all of this is false. All of this is wrong. That's not what a p-value is. Sir? I'm not, are you referring to the fact that it's, it's, uh, it's um, you know, less than, the, the, it, We'll take it, if it's, if it's 0.05, that means there's a 95% chance that within the interval it's, uh, no. it's likely to be there. No, that's absolutely false. That is forbidden. <laughs> I'm not kidding. That is forbidden for you to say. Leave the room. <laughs> that's forbidden by the theory. You're not allowed to say that. I'm not kidding. <laughs> what is it? We see, so nobody knows, okay, because they can't, I'm going to tell you what the true definition here, here is. But nobody can remember. All they can remember is this. If it's less than the magic number, the theory is true, or probably true. And that's false. That is absolutely, the reason statistics is such a problem, we see all this garbage put out, is because it does the thinking for you. The ways that were developed in the 40s and, and, and 50s uh, were developed such that people could do this stuff by hand to get easy answers. And sometimes that was okay, and a lot of times it's just not okay at all. <clears throat> what it is, here's the p-value. It's right there. I've actually written it up. I'm going to explain it and, and see if it makes any sense to you. This is why nobody can remember it, because it's not easy. It's just not easy to remember. So you have some data, again, and you have some statistical model. That model has these things called parameters, which I'm representing by this Greek letter theta up there maybe one, maybe lots of them, maybe multidimensional. You then state that some of those parameters equal zero. You say, I assume it's true, the model is true, I have my data, these parameters, I'm saying that those parameters are equal to zero. I'm saying they're equal to zero. I then calculate this thing called a statistic over here. I'm, no, I'm, I'm losing half of you already, if not all of you. This little T with the little X, that means some function of the data. And you're free to pick it. It's free to, you can choose anything you want. There's a lot of freedom in statistics. <laughs> Just take anything you want. Then I can calculate the probability, assuming that the parameters are equal to zero and assuming that the model is true. If I were to be able to repeat this experiment in exactly the same way, precisely the same way, except randomly different, an infinite number of times, not a large number, not 10 times, not 100 times, but an infinite number of times, what's the probability I'd see a value of that statistic, the capital T, larger than the one that I actually got? That's the p-value. It has nothing to do with that first equation, which is what you wanted to know. Anybody can get a small p-value. They come for free. If you have a sample size that increases, you are guaranteed to get a small p-value. It's just a guarantee. If you increase your sample size, you will get a small p-value. If you go into the data and you start manipulating, because you have the freedom to choose your model and you have the freedom to choose these statistics, you will be able to manipulate your data such that you can find these small p-values. It is just trivially easy. If you can't find a small p-value with your data, you're not trying hard enough. Yes, sir. Oh, well, um, sure, I mean, the, the, that's okay, and there's the, I don't, let, let me come back to that question at the, at the end, and I'll tell you how to sort of better think about this. Yes, that's correct. And, and, and then you can for any given problem, there is no p-value. For any given set of data, for any model, anything that you want to be true, there is no unique p-value. There's many of them that exist, and there's an infinite number that you can generate for any given set of data. But, but this is the problem. The only thing people remember is if it's less than 0.05, 
then your effect is real. They the thinking has been done for you. When in fact, what we should be doing is this top line. We should be calculating the probability the theory is true. And how do we do that? Well, that's easy enough to do. There are statistical methods that can do this, but they involve more work. They're harder. And in fact, what they basically tell you to do is wait. They have the data, you have this model that you have just made, and you have this supposition, this theory that you want to think is true. And so what you do is you make a prediction of data that you have never seen before. And then what you have to do, the most grueling, painful thing, is you have to wait for that data to show up. And then you see if that data conforms to the model that you have just created. If it does, you're in business. If it does not, your model should be trashed. That happens, as I said, in physics and chemistry and so forth. It does not happen in most of the so-called soft sciences. Sociology, psychology, education, all this kind of stuff. All they do is pump out these p-values and they think they have something. And then they all cite each other. Everybody cites each other and everybody confirms what they want to believe. And the process, and we saw what happens in the real life example of the CARB uh, meeting. Yes, it's true, all your criticisms are correct and just, but since everybody else does it, we'll do it too. Oh, there's a, there, are, there, are, there's, but there, are, there are there are papers that are out there. A guy named Ioannidis, if I'm pronouncing his name correctly, why most findings are false. He published a very famous one in medicine. That uh, yeah, there are out there. And th these things are known. So what, I, what I'm telling you, these criticisms are actually well known to uh, statisticians, um, but they don't get disseminated very well. And the reason for that is uh, most statistics is learned. Uh, from non-statisticians. So psychologists will teach their own students statistics because they had once done a model, they know how to do a regression, the software gives them the answers, therefore they're experts. They'll, they'll teach their students this stuff and all these things just keep going. Okay, let me, let me finish up with this. this um, there's a famous website called Numbers Watch that some of you probably know of, uh, run by a gentleman in England who has a complete list of things that are caused by global warming. This is kind of the opposite of the pomegranate effect. This is not the complete list. This is about a quarter of it. I couldn't fit the entire thing on there. And I have some sna uh, snatches from some of this. This is the very first one right there. We're going to see, because of global warming, more witches hacked to death. Global warming is going to cause this. How does he know this? Well, this professor of economics from Berkeley, he did a statistical study. He had a model, the model gave him his small p-value, and therefore he was able to say, with statistically significant chance, that more witches will be hacked to death with machetes, just because of carbon dioxide. So it's a, oyster herpes, of course, is dangerous. <laughs> Good news is, global warming is going to help coral reefs grow. The bad news is, it's going to devastate coral reefs. And as Charlie Gibson rightly said, we don't usually think of the Taliban and global warming in the same sentence. I know I didn't. Plankton are going to bloom out of control, but they're also going to be wiped out. The good news for, for doctors for disaster preparedness is wars are on the increase. Climate wars. Wars caused by climate. And also, of course, street crime. It's going to increase. This goes without saying. I mean, when it's warmer, people kill more. The bad news, as Willie will tell you, polar bears are on their way out. Uh, but the good news, spiders are getting bigger. <laughs> Panda bears are also out of here, but sh sharks are going to flourish. Shark attacks will increase. So what happens is, if it's a warm, fuzzy, photogenic, cuddly animal, it's out of here, it's gone. <laughs> Statistics say so. But if it bites, stabs, sticks, sucks your blood, all of those are going to thrive and increase. This is what we have found. All of these are peer-reviewed results. 
Every single one of them. And this is obvious, the, the come on in, the water's fine fallacy, the, the, the bandwagon, the, the grants are flowing fallacy, a good chance I'll get quoted in the press fallacy. As it is so easy to get a positive result, you can say anything. And if it conforms to what people expect to hear, it'll get published. And you'll have some notion of celebrity even as we all seen what's happening with global warming. I'm not talking about global warming itself. I'm talking about the causes of global warming, or the supposed causes of global warming. We could talk about global warming another time. I guess Professor Lindzen can talk more about that than, than I can. Um, well, I, you know, as a meteorologist, you had to face uh, certain certain jokes that people tell you all the time, and as a statistician, everybody's always quoting Mark Twain at me, and I have to pretend to be, you know, uh, to find the thing funny for the 18,000th time. So I thought I'd give him a new thing to say about damn lies, all that kind of thing. You've heard that saying before? No? Yes? Okay. Now, there are methods that, uh, that uh, we, we talked about here, but they are more complicated. They, uh, the software for some of these things is uh, it's out there, it's free, it's widely available, but it requires a little bit more expertise. If you're teaching people, the, the problem is we can teach these methods, and I do, I teach my own students these new methods, but I have to eschew the math. I can't teach them any math except for hand waving because the newer methods are more mathematical and they require more expertise. So unless you want, this is why they don't, they're not introduced so readily. So if you want to try to teach these things, you have to require people, require of people a more sophisticated background. They need to have at least calculus under their belt before they can even think about some of these things. So you can't have an introductory statistics course where you try to teach them any math. And that's why it doesn't really happen because professors like to think that the subject is a mathematical subject when in fact it is not. It is an applied philosophy. It's epistemology, if you like. So these things are out there, and they can be used, um, and I encourage you to look them up. Uh, I have a website, uh, you'll, you know, and there's plenty of links, and it's in the packet. You'll, you can see my thing in there. Uh, I guess that's it. Uh, we're, too, we're way too certain about things, and the fault is mostly mine and <laughs> my colleagues. Thank you. I mean, the, the, the evidence-based medicine question, getting back to that. So, it, it, you know, it's like any other question. If you have a bunch of measurements on a bunch of people, you then have to say, well, how do those accord with some, how, how do I quantify the uncertainty in them? You already know everything there is to know about the past data, right? You know, on every one of those individuals that you measured in this, whatever uh, meta analysis, you know what a meta-analysis is, right? It's like the subprime mortgage crisis where you have, individual loans, each of them highly risky and sort of junk. But when you compile them all together, they were these triple A rated uh, instruments that banks traded. And meta-analysis is the same kind of thing, where you have individual studies that show no effect, no effect, no effect, no effect. You compile them all together and all of a sudden we have an effect. That's the miracle of statistics. So, but evidence-based medicine is no different than anything else. If you have measurements on something, you could posit a model and then you could make these projections and see whether or not it works. What do you think of individual, uh, infinitely variable individuals being treated according to averages and physicians being forced to treat Oh, no, no, that's... Uh, according to averages. I, I don't, I don't, I, I'm not going to... I know what your opinion is on that. I, I, my opinion is uh, the doctor will know best. Uh, I think that I would not force anybody to, to do that kind of thing. No, not, not based on that kind of weak evidence. Sir. I'm just going to say the sad thing with the EPA and Harvard and all these things is that they ruin people's lives and uh, ordinarily are helpful. Uh, this, this is not necessarily true. They, it's very beneficial to a small class of society. And that's the class of society that's making the rules. So they're, they're making out like bandits. They've never been to a farm. <laughs> yeah, I would argue that the, the real issue here is that the modeling is misused. In other words, 
rather than look at the modeling as a continuing effort to explain the data in the real world, the model becomes the absolute as soon as it's published and accepted by the enforcement division of EPA. Once it's there, yeah. this is no longer the discussion of statistics or the real world. It's simply a by fiat, by bureaucratic of the model. fiat. Yeah, that's uh, that's a political question. That's exactly right. I want to give you an example that you could use. Uh, it comes from climate studies. Mm -hmm. um, the, the U.S. government has been supporting something called CCSP, Climate Change Science Program. Okay. One of the, uh, I'll make it uh, very general. The question is whether models and observations agree. That's the issue. Um, and uh, they, they try very desperately to show that they agree, even though in the report itself, it's clear that they don't agree. Yeah. But in the executive summary, in the executive summary, they, are managed, they manage to make them agree. How do they do that? Well, the models have a kind of a Gaussian distribution of temperature trends. And the, the observations, not quite Gaussian, but they're, they're sort of distributed. So instead of using distributions, they use the concept of range. That is the extreme values. And they plot the ranges. And you get the ranges to overlap just a little bit. Wow, well, that's it. They overlap. Therefore, they agree. And therefore, the models and observations agree. The concept of range is, of course, the extreme values of a Gaussian. And uh, yeah. that means the more observation, the more data points you have, the wider the range, the narrower the distribution, yeah. but the, the range must be wider. That's so right. you get the paradoxical result that the range increases as your accuracy increases. Yeah, so the, the interesting thing is that meteorology, before climatology hit, when meteorology was its own science, uh, meteorologists were the ones who were sort of creating these methods of statistics which I'm talking about, the, the idea of skill. Is a forecast really useful? Does it have skill, we say? The mathematical results, uh, pushing the theory forward, all that kind of stuff. And people used to know very well how to look at these forecasts. And that's why weather forecasts have improved so greatly o over the years, because they've applied all these methods. They understand what a forecast w was, what a prediction was, and how good a prediction was. But that sort of got turned around in climatology where it was the goodness of the model itself and how well that model looked to people and how well that model mimicked previous data. Not how well it predicted anymore, which in some sense they can't really do. We'd have to wait. Nobody wants to wait. Everybody wants to do things now. So, but all that was completely reversed. All the stuff, all the lessons, all those great lessons we had learned just out the window. Yeah. Thank you.